Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. everyone and welcome to Turn the Page. I'm Jen, your co-host today, and I am joined by my fabulous colleague. Hey, this is Jessica, child of the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> we're all children of the 90s here, I think, today. And we're here with the author, um, a very prolific writer of YA fiction and comics. Uh, could I ask you to introduce yourself and your new book, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Maureen Gu. I am the author of, yes, several YA novels and some comics, um, but my latest book, which comes out April 11th, is called Throwback. And I have to say, you got a, you, you got a really nice review from Veronica Roth on Goodreads, like, which was like so exciting because I love her too. And it was just really cool. I was like, I love it when authors that I like show each other love. <laughs> I know that was so um, kind of her. I didn't even realize that she did that till, um, you know, because authors should stay away from their Goodreads pages uh, for their, you know, mental health, in my opinion, for my mental health. Anyways, I have to. But I was on there updating some info and I was like, oh, look at these reviews. Let's just check out. And then I was like, oh, Veronica. Um, yeah, I mean, full disclosure, she's a very good friend of mine, um, and she blurbed the book, so, but she did, didn't did have to go above and beyond and post on Goodreads, too, but she did it, because she is awesome. Yeah, that is super cool. Um, it is very dangerous to look at, yeah, <laughs> to look at your reviews on Goodreads, so I'm glad that you had, like, a good experience this one time doing it. Um, yeah, we both really love this book, and we love the premise, you know, like, having grown up in the 90s ourselves, and I'm wondering, like, what uh, made you want to tell a story that involved the 90s, but also, like, a, a sort of time travel twist? Yeah, this is a departure from for me because my um, other YA novels are just straight, you know, realistic contemporary, but I have always loved time travel stories. I mean, they're, I realize that is just like a genre or I don't know if it's a genre or trope that I'm just a sucker for, like time-crossed um, romances or just like, you know, that light sprinkling of sci-fi um, and speculative, like a hint of that. I really love that. Um so for this book, you know, I, more than anything, the thing that was my guiding star was I really wanted to write a mother-daughter relationship book. And it's been something I knew I would have to tackle one day as a, a YA author, because my own relationship with my mother was so, was the most complicated and difficult one I had as a teenager. And I just knew that it would be kind of something that would take a lot of emotional, uh, work on my part and so I was kind of pushing it back like I don't know if I'm ready for this but when I thought of the time travel idea because uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is Back to the Future I do not shy away from making that comp because it is my homage to Back to the Future um, once I figured out like who maybe there's a way for me to make this mother heavy mother daughter stuff fun in the package of time travel which I just love so much and it's a way for me to like you know um dip my toe into something different and also you know as a cheat for myself because I grew up in the 90s as well you know I get to do it in the 90s like I can just kind of dig back into my memories and really create this world very authentically um and so you know because I also kind of don't I get the criticism that a lot of why authors um we kind of stick to what we know, like a lot of us have outdated references and we make excuses to talk about the 80s and 90s um, because it is what we know. But I thought this was a great excuse to have to go there. And I had so much, so much fun going back to the 90s. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, I love things that revisit that period, especially things with a YA setting, because I think, you know, it is true. Yes, that like a lot of the authors and adult readers like were alive and young during that time ourselves. But I think also like we all kind of have really interesting relationships, not just with like the time periods that we grew up in, but with those that our parents grew up in too. So, you know, like 
I think it's really interesting for like teen readers to get to explore like the the worlds that their parents and previous generations lived in. Um, what was it like imagining your teen protagonist like and capturing a voice of another generation? Like, was there work that went into that? Yeah, you know, there's always, um, I've been writing YA for 10 years now. And so when I started this, I was a little closer to my teens. Actually, when I wrote my, uh, what ended up being my debut novel, I was really young. I was 22 or 23. And so I remember writing that and being so, there was almost no separation between me and high school. Like I remembered every detail of like the principal's office. I remember like school schedules, lunch times, all that stuff. Now all that stuff is such a blur. But the one thing that I always talk about when I talk about writing YA, because a lot of people, I get asked this question, like, how do you stay, because you write contemporary YA, how do you um, know how the teens talk? And how do you keep it from feeling outdated? And I always have the same answer, which is, um, I don't, I don't try to think too hard about it. Because if you do, you get really um, paralyzed by it. Because if you try to chase after exactly how teens talk and what they like and what they're, you know, it's, it's really hard. So instead, I always think of it as I'm capturing this moment in time. I am writing for right now. So yes, I'm going to talk about Instagram. I'm going to talk about celebrities. Um, you know, I might drop like a BTS reference or whatever, right? Because that's the world that I am writing in. And that is when some kid in the future, you know, I would be lucky if this is still like a book kids are reading 20 years from now or something, right? So if they read it, they'll be like, oh, this was written in 2023. So this is why they have these references. Because I think about when we were kids and we read, you know, I was actually reading Judy Bloom. 15, 20 years after Judy Bloom books came out. And so she had references too that I'd be like, hmm, she, what is she talking about? Like a menstruation belt. I don't know what that is, but I can guess, right? You can just guess and you're like, okay, it's something to do with periods and it's like old school, but whatever. Or Anna and Martin used to make all these references to um, Haley Mills and the Bobsy twins. And I'd be like, don't know what that is, but okay, whatever, right? Um, and so I think, you know, readers are savvy. They know that they're just reading something that was written in a different time maybe, and they move on with it. But at the same time, because this book is specifically time travel, I did have to make sure there was a contrast between Gen Z and Gen X, which is the two generations of the parents. And um, luckily, because I'm a YA author, I do pay attention to, you know, I'm on social media a lot for better, or for worse. Um, and I am paying attention to things like fashion and music because, you know, it's just something that's part of my world if as a I pay attention to what teens like and what young people like. So I'm not, I don't feel that far removed from that world. It's not that I'm a part of that world necessarily, but I'm paying attention. And so I felt like actually writing from Sam's point of view, and Sam is the is the daughter, wasn't as hard as writing from Priscilla's point of view with the mom, because Priscilla is so different from the way I I am. Like her worldview, she's very, um, you know, she really bought into like assimilating into American culture. And she's a little older than I was, or I am. So that tiny micro generation between me and her, there's a big difference in our high school experiences. So she really, she's the age of like some of my older cousins and we all grew up in the same city, but they had very different experiences than I did in high school. You know, they got made fun of for Korean stuff, you know, and by the time I was in high school, like more than half my friends were Korean American. I, you know, my school is so diverse. I just didn't have the same kind of issues that they had. And so I felt like it was easy for me to write from Sam's point of view because I very much live in Sam's world, you know, and the, I was never in Priscilla's headspace. So in a way it was, it wasn't that hard for me to be, to see the culture shock through, through Sam's POV too, because forced me to go back to the nineties and all these microaggressions and funny things that happened to me in the nineties. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> this is messed up when you look back on it now through today's eyes, even if I live through it, you know, I've had enough time apart that I, I was able to channel Sam's reactions to think to things pretty easily. 
Yeah, that's actually, you know, I like that. I mean, there's a lot to unpack and I like that Sam, you know, she is, she's looking at her mother's experience and her mother's, you know, trying to sort of, you know, she doesn't, she's trying to assimilate um, to a more, you know, the Caucasian community. And um, she's also, you know, like, the way I'm a Gen X person, I am very happy to call myself a Gen X person, but I am, uh, I, I would like to think that a lot of Gen X people are like this, but who knows? I, I, I feel that I am at least open to being like looking back and not having complete nostalgia glasses and being like, oh, that was all really not cool. And like some of the things that we said that were okay to say, or we thought were okay to say were definitely not. Um, and I kind of like the connection between Gen X and Gen Y and I'm not knocking millennials <laughs> by any, but I do, but I do <laughs> think in a way there is, um, I, I would hope at least that there is sort of that tendency for someone from Gen X to kind of connect with Gen Y in that way, um, to, to look back and be like, mm, you know what we were, cause I, I, all, I felt like, you know, Gen X tried very hard to stand for something. And I guess every, <laughs> most, most uh, generations do, but, you know, I, I would like to hope that at least there is that, um, chance to kind of look back on, you know, like the casual racism and the body image stuff and all of that, not great stuff that I think Gen Y really is trying to sort of reclaim. Um, and I liked seeing that with Sam and Priscilla, um, but they were mother and daughter, which makes it even more fun. Yeah, it it was interesting to, to you know, because, but Priscilla is so a different kind of Gen X. She was never like the cool Gen X that wore flannel and like listened to, you know, Pearl Jam. She was like, I want to, she was still actually kind of stuck in John Hughes land of like um, Americana teen, you know? Um, so I think if she was cool Gen X, like reality bites Gen X, she and Sam could connect more. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. But like, you know, that's why I kind of, you know, I didn't really have much time to explore her dad because this is a mother daughter story and we travel back in time pretty quickly, but I, I made her dad, like I snuck in a little reference at the end that he was, um, did I say he liked emo? No, he liked goth. He was goth. I did something to make the dad a little more. Um, he was more Gen X counterculture. I hinted at that because I thought that would be funny. But yeah, it's there is a connection there. And you know, millennials, that's me, but I'm like the oldest millennial, apparently. Like they call me like geriatric. I'm like the first I, I'm, I'm I'm the youngest Gen X <laughs> or yeah, you're probably like geriatric one millennial. Yeah, we're probably like one year apart, right? But yeah, it's, I think because millennials are considered like we didn't, we kind of grew up more, um, I mean, I don't know, who knows? These generalizations are kind of crazy, but I think about my my youth and like, it was very, it seemed compared to today, like I kind of had it easy as far as like thinking the world would end. I never really thought the world would end except then there was 9-11. So we, we did go through stuff too. So anyway, there was a lot to chew on as I worked on this book and thinking back and especially because I wrote this actively during 2020, you know, and it just felt so tumultuous, the world and everything and everybody's views, perceptions were shifting so rapidly every day, it seemed like, because we were always going through some insane trauma every day or huge world change every day of 2020 and 2021 and some people still going through it now for sure so it, re it really did make me have to think about all this stuff with America and time and the wisdom of time or not or repeating history's mistakes over and over again you know yeah I think that this book like does so much to explore generational difference um, in the way that we've been talking at, about like in, in terms of like cultural generations but I also you know a, a big theme obviously is in terms of like 
generations of immigration, you know, so there's like a big divide here too between like first generation and second generation. And I was thinking as I read that like starting in the 90s, I remember encountering a lot of like first gen YA stuff um, and TV shows too. Like I remember Margaret Cho's TV show that was sort of very much about like, a, a you know, a first gen teen like in the 90s. Um, you know, like, so when you were exploring like the second gen perspective and these two different perspectives between mother and daughter, like, um, did you find yourself uh, with interesting insights into each side, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah, I mean, I had to, so the way when I basically, so I had this idea for this book, okay, this mother and daughter, they don't have a good relationship and, um the time travel is going to, you know, either heal that or, you know, have them explore it. And I realized, you know, if I'm doing the math correctly, <laughs> the mother is no longer um, going to, you know, it's possible she is my age and that she was first generation. And it just totally shifted the whole trajectory of the book because, yeah, um, a lot of, I think that's part of what uh, people found, you know, exciting about this book is that now we are finally in a position to write about second generation experiences which you know it's not like I'm the first to do this by any means and of course there's been lots of Asian American immigrants here forever but specifically Korean Americans in Southern California I feel like we are now reaching a point where the kids are teens and this is now it's you know my cousins are have teens now as their kids and I really thought about it from that point of view, like, okay, that's a whole different experience. Whatever, what conflicts are they going to have with their parents? It's going to be so different from what I had with my parents, right? But there will still always be conflict. Um, and I became a mom. I got pregnant in 2019. And then I had a baby when I was writing this in 2020. And I thought I had a lot of questions in my head too of my kid what is his relationship going to be like with immigrant, like being an immigrant, you know, because for me, I always call myself an immigrant kid, even though I'm not, because I was born here, but the way I was raised is like, yeah, I, I ate only Korean food. I only, my parents spoke to me in Korean. When I watch the Olympics, I will always root for Korea. I, you know, the Korean in me like rages out all the time. Um, and I feel when if I go to Korea, even though I don't, I can't speak Korean that well, like that is to me, like, I feel like this is my homeland. Yet I am very American, you know? And so then I think about my kid who is only half Korean. And I thought about like, what is he going to, what's going to be saved from that? Like how Korean is he going to feel? It made me really like anxious. Like I want him to feel Korean. I want him to feel that connection. I will actively have to do the work to make that happen, I think he will have to spend a lot of time with his grandparents. But then I also thought about like, man, but he's going to grow up in a world post BTS, post K, you know, like he's not going to deal with the crap that a lot of Asian American men grew up with my age, which is like being, feeling emasculated. You know, he's growing up in a world of BTS, Shang-Chi, like all this stuff, right? Hopefully it'll continue to just get better. Like maybe he'll want to be, maybe he'll want to use his Korean name, you know? Um, maybe he will think it's cool to be, you know, um, Korean. I mean, hopefully he will. Who knows what the world will be like when he's 16. So it made me really think about all of that. And it's a very unique, you know, cause I'm not living that, but you know, a lot of people ask authors like, how do you, but it's like, that's why we're authors. We have these like imaginations and we're good liars. You know, we can like fake everything. Um, so I just had to really, imagine okay here are the conflicts that what I think would happen Gen Z is growing up right now especially post pan post pandemic or I mean we're still kind of in a pandemic right but like post lockdown trauma all the stuff that happened like they are so much more like they have to be such advocates for themselves in the world right and so Sam is going to be like this and then her mom grew up you know, really under the parents, like her parents really pursued the American dream and believed in it. And she wanted to fit in in America. So their conflicts are going to be so different. And with 
with high school and everybody else. And then they're going to naturally have this, this um, conflict themselves with how they view their values in the world. And so anyways, that was really interesting for me to explore. And that is the heart of the book. That is the big conflict. That is the big question. Um, and I think, I think that to me is what appealed to me most about this writing this, that I felt like this is new territory. I'm really excited to explore it. Um, and, you know, it was really just like kind of a delight and also really hard. <laughs> so did you find yourself having to revisit like old magazine articles or TV shows or something just to kind of get yourself back into the 90s? Like, did you do some uh, time travel research yourself? The very first thing I did was make a playlist because I do that anyways. But of course, for a 90s book, I'm like, here we go. 19 Originally, the book took place in 1993. So I did 1993 music research. Um, and then when I bumped up to 1995, let me tell you that so much more, I think it's because I'm younger. So I was like, yeah, 1995 is when everyone's everything started to happen. I had so much fun with the music. That is the number one thing that gets me back into headspace. But eventually, you know, I wanted to, um, I, I already remember all the fashion, to be honest. It's like so burned in my head, but I did look up old Delia's catalogs. Cause do you remember Tumblr had like all these like cool Delia's catalogs, um, reproduced amazing. And I also did watch a couple of nineties movies, you know, like Clueless and like, um, 10 things I hate about you. Um, but I have to say I did not have to do that much research because it was just still burned in my brain, a lot of that stuff. Um, but it was a good excuse to do the research is, you know, and the magazine articles, you know, I did. I looked up old 17. I looked up 17 covers from 1994 to no 95 to 99 because those were my high school years. Sorry to give specific dates and ruin everybody. I am old, but like when I looked at those 17 covers, it literally was like, for me, time travel. I felt like I remember every single detail of those magazine covers because back in the day, that's all we had. We didn't have the internet. We just poured over these teen magazines for better or for worse because some of it was super toxic and it just never left my brain. So I remember looking up like 17 magazines and they would show specific fashion spreads, like a prom spread from 1996, I remember. I was like, I remember this prom spread, like as if I live this, you know, <laughs> I remember this exact dress and this hot guy. I remember this, you know, this redheads, curly hair, like I remember everything. So it was really kind of a trip to, to go back and look at those. <laughs> it is amazing. Like how, uh, you know, many of those memories are just like these deep sense memories, you know, cause I remember looking at that, those Delia catalogs. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I can remember which ones I circled, you know, and I, <laughs> I remember which ones I went into the store and looked at and tried on and wasn't happy with, you know, and it was just like, oh, it's, yeah, it seems like really fun to sort of like, uh, in this book, like you revisit it through, you know, the eyes of the generation that lived it, but you also sort of like get to see it from the perspective of someone who didn't live it through Sam, you know, and it's fun to sort of have like both those perspectives on it. What's wild is that if you guys look at Delia's catalogs now, the kids would be wearing all of that stuff today. All of it. There's not even one thing that would be like, we would never wear this. It's like, nope, we would, we would wear this. And also what's amazing about those, like the sensory, you know, memory that you are referring to. It's yeah. It's not even just like the fashion. It was like the feeling of yearning that I had when I looked at those Delia's catalogs, like, I wish I could be this girl. I will, you know, my parents did not let me buy any of that kind of stuff. It was like a dream for me to be a Delia's catalog girl and, or to be a girl that could wear those clothes, that yearning, just like the full force of it, just like hit me square in the face. And it was really great though, because remembering that it, it really is so wonderful when you're writing YA to remember what it feels like to be a teen, because I do not think any of those feelings change in any generation. You know, it's, you still feel like I hate high school. When will my real life begin? I wish I could look like that. 
I wish my life was like this. All the other teens have lives like this, but my life sucks. It's like this, you know? So all of that, it's really great to like have that, you know, cycle through me again. <laughs> um, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, Jess, do you have any more questions or? No, I mean, I think like for me, you know, this has been super fun. And I mean, Jen was like literally running downstairs being like, Jess, look, time travel book, mother, daughter, 90s. And I was like, yes, let's do this. Let's do this. Um, and it's been fun to talk to you about it. Um, you know, mother, daughter stories. Um, I lost my mom recently. So they're very, uh, yeah, they're very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, special to me, especially now. And like me being somebody from the nineties and my mom in a way, like she was somebody from the sixties, but like the stuff that like I admired about the sixties was not a hundred percent her. So I kind of got it a little bit, you know, I'd be like, Oh, but hippies and this and that. And she's just like, yeah, no, <laughs> not me. But, um, you know, I, I think that, um, that was like an automatic selling point for me, but I think what I really want to know, cause we're talking about music and, um, I love that you hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, like I always say, I'm like, when people think about grunge music, it was a very short, small, specific time period in the nineties. Mm -hmm. began. The nineties began with boy bands and it ended with boy bands and grunge was like in the middle um, what, what are some of your favorite go-to songs? You want to time travel. What do you love? I made a soundtrack for Priscilla and I made a soundtrack for Sam. I'm going to pull up Priscilla's soundtrack right here. Um, the gym blossoms heavily <laughs> played a part in this uh, <laughs> time travel for me as did the cranberries dreams. Cranberries to me is everything. Um, I had to put in boys to men, no doubt, Mariah Carey, Smashing Pumpkins, Weezer, and Alanis. Those are like, for me, you know, that those are my teen go-tos, obsessed with oh, everything. <laughs> and I'm not knocking boy bands. It's just very funny to me. Oh, I love boy bands, by the yeah. way. I was way too old for them. And I was like a huge NSYNC fan. I didn't love boy bands. I only liked NSYNC, just to be clear. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. No judgment. I just, I, I just think concert funny. way well yeah. into college. <laughs> the oldest person there, I didn't care. <laughs> I just think it's funny because people are always like grunge music, and I'm just like, yes, but that was a very specific time period that was bookended by the popular music being yeah. different. Yeah, um, new kids and then Backstreet Boys. You know, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh oh well thank you again so much for joining us this has been an absolute delight and you know we both just love this book so much so thanks for coming and talking about it thank you guys I just I really love this conversation and I really appreciate it thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay listeners so please 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 pick up throwback it is an absolute delight you'll find it at your favorite library or independent bookstore as of when you hear this. So please, please pick it up. Uh, this has been Jen and my co-host. Jessica. With Turn the Page, and it is now time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.